My guest tonight is a California kid who changed the world of stock car racing by turning a southern tradition into a national conversation. From the time he earned his first checkered flag at just five years old, Jeffrey Michael Gordon would go on to dominate the field at every level. He was NASCAR's Rookie of the Year, a three-time Daytona 500 champion, and the first driver to win the Brickyard. He amassed 93 career wins, earned four Cup Series championships, and started 797 consecutive races, placing him number one all time in the history of NASCAR. But before he won 13 races in a single season, did you know he raced on two wheels before the age of four, was emancipated at 13 years old so he could legally compete, and has held a longtime passion for breakdancing. <laughs> Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, racing is not what I like to do, it's winning. Please welcome number 24, Jeff Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I sense uh, I sense a little bit of anticipation of a hell of a conversation in this yeah. crowd. They. They want to get to know about Jeff Gordon, this guy they've seen with this helmet. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm a little scared, actually. No, I'm, you're I'm, I'm, not. I don't get nervous very often going 200, but I'm a little nervous right I, now. Really? <laughs> I, I guess we could even start there. We're going to start at the beginning, but I guess for purposes of, of this conversation, I have never understood how you guys as drivers put the fear aside. You compartmentalize it. Do you ignore it? How do you get into a car that's going 180, 190, 200 miles an hour and not think, my God, if I lose control or if somebody else does, something really bad could happen? Yeah, it, it, you got to be a little crazy, I think, to do <laughs> what, what, what a race car driver does. But it's not like the first time, it'd be like riding a bike. You don't just go hop on a bike and jump on the biggest hill and go straight down the hill. You, you build up to it. And, and so as a kid getting behind the wheel of a car that was going maybe five miles per hour and then 10 miles per hour and then 15, you, you build up the, not only the courage, but the ability. You're born in the early 70s in Vallejo, California, youngest of two. Yeah. Just, just describe that for us, if yeah. you would. Um, my mom and my uh, real father divorced. Uh, I probably was just a, a couple months old. And so my mom met my stepfather, and he's the one that loved cars. He's the one that worked on, on cars. But he never drove cars himself. But uh, he wanted to connect to you know, his stepkids uh, and wanted to introduce us to things and, and be engaged. And he you know, was very, very involved right away with us. And, and that started with, with bikes. I one day I learned how to ride a bike. I think I was three, and you know took the training wheels off right away. And he 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 just whoa you know how did he learn how to ride this bike so quick without training wheels at such a young age? And I think it was not long after that he's going out and buying a BMX bike and we're going to the racetrack. Your mom, Carol, yes, doesn't like the idea of you racing bikes. It's too dangerous. Yeah. So, we, so what, it, what, what does John do, your stepdad? <laughs> Let's buy him a little race motorized car. vehicle. <laughs> Let's race those little bad boys and see how he does. Well, it's funny. He, he did a little bit of motorcycle riding, and he broke about every bone in his body doing it. And so I know that he wasn't real keen on motorcycles uh, or two wheels either, but it just seemed like in my neighborhood, kids were riding bikes, and we had a BMX bike track. And so he, he saw where I, I was, I had the urge to compete. But I just wasn't good at anything else <laughs> except for uh, things that moved. As a kid, some uh, other kids in his neighborhood or someone he knew raced cars, these quarter midgets. I mean, is it fair to say this is kind of like a glorified go-kart? I mean... Yeah, it's, it, the only difference is it has a seat belt with a roll cage and the engine is is in the back, and you race on oval tracks. And you know most go karts you race on on road courses. And so yeah, so he brought home two of those: one for me, one for my sister. 
uh, I, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that, that day he comes home and my mom and my dad said, hey kids, go look out the window. It was like Christmas and it wasn't Christmas, but uh, I looked out the window and I instantly just ran for it, jumped straight in and just thought it was the coolest thing ever. What kind of a dad was John uh, to you? John was a guy that would just take the shirt off his back to help, help anybody. I think uh, one of the things that he taught me early on uh, I, we were in a race, and I, I'd won a few races by this time, but um, in quarter midgets, they're, they're open wheel cars, and so you really don't want to make contact with one another. Not only will it cause a crash or damage your car, but uh, it's a little bit dangerous. So one time I'm, I was racing, and I made a really gutsy move and I drove over the wheel of this kid and 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 kind of drove up over the top of his car but I kept going and I won the race and and my stepdad after the race I'm pulling in and the best part about racing right is going and getting the trophy especially you know if you like the girl that's handing out the trophy right, yeah um, I learned that really early yeah. on. Uh, Not a boy. And, and and so I'm ready to, to get the trophy and my dad says to me he says you're going to give the trophy to that kid. You know, I don't remember what the kid's name was. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, that's not how we race. He goes, you don't. He goes, you race clean, you race hard, but you don't drive over the top of somebody. Yeah, that's not how <laughs> we talk. And I, was, I thought he was joking, but he really made me do it. I mean, I, I went over there. It was the hardest thing I think I ever had to do. I handed that trophy to him. And I'm sure I had tears in my eyes afterwards because I didn't get it, but it was a great lesson for me, not only about racing, but about life and, and just, you know, doing things right. And I think that's a lot about my parents. They're very ethical. They always wanted to treat others the way you wanted them to treat you. Um, you know, you work hard for, for everything that you get out of life and you get out of it what you put into it. This video that we're going to show you is one of the cutest damn things I've ever seen. And, and on a practical level, it really speaks to your relationship with John and the way he communicated with you and what he wanted out of you with regard to feedback right. of the quarter midget car and how it reacted on the track. You're about seven years old on a TV show. Here it is. Jeff lets his dad know how the car is running and what problems the course is giving him. Then they make the needed adjustments. The car sliding at all? No. Not at all? No. The front end bouncing? Yeah. Over in that corner, when you come out of it, it's bumpy. But when you come into this corner, it's bumpy. Uh-huh. It's not bumpy up by the wall, though, right? Nuh-uh. You know how Dennis shows you to bring yeah. the car into the turn? Well, he tells me to cut into the corner. I know. Cut into the corner, right. Okay, so but if we... that makes it slide up, too. Sometimes he wins and sometimes he loses. But in general, Jeff keeps setting new speed records. And though winning trophies is nice, both Jeff and his stepdad agree that the most important thing they get out of racing is the friendship that they have with each other. Oh, it's so great. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> there, there was that communication and this understanding of how your car was reacting when it was going around the track, and, and the foundation was laid right there. I gave him information. If I wanted to make the car go faster, I gave him the information I felt like I needed, and he could tune on it, and that became a huge part, and, and is for every race car driver. That being able to diagnose the car, give those kinds of details, and, and communicate in a way where people understand it. Oh, okay, I know exactly where you're talking about. I, I, I actually am picturing it the way you describe it. That's what, to me, separates the great drivers from the good drivers. You won 35 races between the ages of six and seven years old. So you're, you're like, you know, I, I know you probably don't want to say it, but I can. You're like a prodigy. I never needed a push to get in the race car and, and go racing. I just, I loved it. And I think what what I loved about it was just the competition and pushing the limits and, and, and what, I was very competitive too, especially if it had a, a, an engine or motor. I, I, it didn't, it would intimidate me at first. I wasn't so sure, but I'd still do it. And then when I did it, I was good at it. And so you asked me to, 
throw a football. I can throw a football, but I can't throw it good. You know, you asked me to, to run, uh, you know, a hundred yard dash. I could do it, but I wasn't good at it. So I realized pretty early on that, that racing was something that I could do and compete and take and have that competitive uh, desire that was in me and actually do something good with it and, and, and get the results. And that happened pretty early. I mean, in 1979, I went to Denver, Colorado. It was what they called the Grand Nationals. And, and I won in my class. And, and I thought then, wow, you know, this, this is not just what we're doing on a week-to-week -week basis. This is the, against the best. And did it again in 81. And, and at, that built my confidence up. But it also, I think, started painting a picture for my stepdad to say, hmm, Maybe we're going to take this further than just quarter midgets one day. And he helped me believe in myself because of that. So at 13, you're in a sprint car, which, again, I mean, anybody who's had a kid, you have some I would of never, your own. never, ever put my kids in a, in a sprint car uh, at age 13. I mean, how fast, never. what's top end speed for a sprint car? I mean, you know, they race on small dirt tracks, so you never get top speed. But if you could, I would say 160 miles per hour. I he jokes, you joke that, you know, the guy should have been arrested for for putting, <laughs> in essence, a child into this into this vehicle that needs a wing on the top of it so it doesn't take off. Oh, I mean, they, they, kill, they kill race car drivers, you know, every year in these types of cars, you know, especially back then. It was very dangerous. Um, and you're going to race against men. Yeah, I, I think... I, that are making I, I, most, a living. Most guys that I was racing against were like 35, 40 years old. And so, but I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I'll be honest, I really didn't. The first time I fired up a little, when I got to that track, and we worked through all the drama of getting, allowing me to go out there. They dropped the green, I'm barely getting on the gas, and the cars were just boom, 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 flying by me, and I was crapping my pants. <laughs> and I finally stood on the gas, and the, the, the tires you know, lit up, and the car went sideways, and it started raining. And, and I actually touched the wall just a little bit, and it rained, and they threw the yellow, and I came in, and I went straight to my dad, and I said, you lied to me. <laughs> you lied to me. I, you told me I could do this. I cannot do this. By the fourth day, I was in, in like, second in my heat, sixth fastest overall, and, and was second in what was the B main. So I didn't make the final 24 cars, but that was out of 58 cars. I was basically like 26 in my first week at 13. So it, it, went, it went pretty well. Yeah, a custom car, about 25 grand. Yeah, it's, racing's not cheap, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean my, I've, I've had people, and you weren't rolling in money and cash. My parents worked so hard to give me that opportunity. I mean, they, they sunk pretty much everything back in, into racing. But just to, again, put this in perspective, you're a Northern California kid. California's not signing off on this 13-year-old that's racing sprint cars. So your family, you have to literally pick up and move mm -hmm. from home because you need to race. Yeah, so my parents had to make a decision. My mom would stay and help run the business, and me and my dad would go back east during the summer, and, and we lived with somebody else in Ohio and raced all summer. That was 1985. And then the next year, uh, they ended up selling their business and buying a house in Indiana, and we all you know, moved there. So is this building up? What do you want from racing at this point? And is it more open-wheel racing in your mind oh yeah new. i went to an indy car race and uh got introduced as a young driver trying to find his way there and i was amazed they they all well how much road racing experience do you have how much money are you gonna bring with you and i was like i don't have any road racing experience and i have no money and so pretty much the doors were closed right away for indy for indy for somebody who's never been in, in either a stock car or a sprint car, what is that jump like, you know? And it wasn't something that was even on your radar yeah. at that point, you know, as, as an early racer. I went from, I'm an open wheel guy and those are taxi cabs right. and, and I'm not, I'm not going to drive that kind of car to, I didn't know I was missing out on this. This is awesome. I love 
the, the, the race. Of course, then I started watching the races on TV, huge crowds everywhere they went. Um, I love the personalities. I love the racing was great, side-by-side -side action. So I, moved, I went down to North Carolina to just go to a driving school, just to drive one. And it goes well. And Buck Baker, who, who you know, long-time NASCAR driver uh, at the time, and, and he said to me, hey, I, I got this guy that's over here. He has a, a race car, and he wants to compete. But I asked him if he would let you drive. And I said, great. What did he say? He goes, he, he said he would. Now, this guy was a large guy. Uh, <laughs> and so the seat are all custom, they're all custom made for each driver. I had to stuff five or six pillows in the seat just to be able to see over the steering wheel and be somewhat secured in the car. And, and, but I, I, there was nothing gonna keep me out of driving that car. And, and so I went out and it went really, really well. I was, I was fast. I got enough attention where some people from Ford started calling me back in Indiana and I'll never forget, I took the call, and a guy named Lee Morse from, from Ford, and he said, hey, Jeff, uh, you know, Lee Morse from Ford, we wanted to talk to you about possibly driving for uh, Bill Davis in the, in the NASCAR, his Bush Grand National Series at that time. And I was all ears. I was like, heck, yeah. And you're racing now, let's say in baseball terms, like in AAA. Right. Not, not to denigrate the product, but Bush Series is one step below yeah, you can where you want to be. You can make a career there, but you're really, especially if you're a young driver, you, you're using that as the stepping stone to get to the cup level. But you're geared up. You've got your guy. You've got Ray Evernham, and and things are about to change for you. I mean, right away we start seeing success. I think uh, it's either it may have been the second race or third race of the year we went to Atlanta, um, big mile and a half, very fast racetrack. And we sat, sat on the pole. I want to say it was either Ern, Dale Earnhardt Sr., I know Mark Martin, maybe Bill Elliott. The top guys at the cup level were all right around me. So I'm on the pole, and, and they're next to me for you know this race. So they're, they're racing. A lot, that happens a lot. Yeah, a lot of still, guys yeah. will race the day before. There's a lot of criticism of that today where – the cup guys come in and dominate these these Xfinity now is what the series is called. And it drives people crazy because uh, they don't feel like they're given the opportunity for these young kids to shine and gain points and, and gain notoriety. And I beg to differ because had I not been in that series racing against the best, learning from them, but also if I didn't hadn't won that race in Atlanta that day and beat Mark Martin and Dale Earnhardt and Dale Jarrett and Mark, uh, um, you know, other Cup drivers, nobody would have even noticed me in my opinion. And and Rick Hendrick noticed me that day, and that's you know what got me to the Cup level. And is that his first real look at you? Yeah. Well, the way he tells the story is the first thing that he saw was some kid driving the car sideways with smoke rolling off the right rear tire. And he, he told, I think it was some people that either worked for him or a friend, he was walking down along the track while the race is, is going on. They were headed somewhere else. And he said, hold on, hold on. This kid's going to wreck. Let's stay here and watch. Um, <laughs> and they kept watching. They kept watching. I kept sliding it through the corner, sliding it through the corner, and I never wrecked. And, and what he found, so after that race, he immediately said, how do we get in touch with, with Jeff Gordon? And this is an opportunity. This, this as, is as good as it gets for a young driver like yourself. It, it, it was, but they weren't winning. They hadn't won a championship. So, uh, you know, s some people at the time were saying to me, if you wait, you're going to be with a championship winning team. Hendrick is a great team, but not quite a championship caliber team at the time. But I wasn't waiting. I do want to establish, though, if I'm sitting across from Michael Phelps, the goal for him is gold medals. If I'm sitting across from Troy Aikman, the goal for him is a Lombardi trophy. If I'm sitting across from Derek Jeter, it's winning a World Series championship. If I'm sitting across from Jeff Gordon, is it Daytona? Does that, does that jump to your mind first, or is it being a cup? champion the ultimate goal is is to win the championship um, and and I don't think any 
career is quite complete if you don't win if you win the championship and you don't win some of the biggest races that the sport has you're 21 years old at your first daytona 500 what was that like and this is why now as a broadcaster i love youth in the sport uh, and seeing these young guys make big bold moves because it's exciting but as a as a competitor when you're a veteran you can't stand that you're like oh my god <laughs> What, what are they doing? This is lap one. I was that kid. Lap one. I want to be leading at Daytona. Three wide in the back stretch. 21-year-old Jeff Gordon down to the inside, going for the lead at turn three. Earlier in the week, they told Jeff Gordon to lay back and learn, but here he comes. And Kyle Petty didn't want any of that three abreast racing. He's back there in three abreast, but he backed off going into that turn. Who's going to lead this first lap? I took him three wide down the back straight away, and I led lap one. You're right. <laughs> I think that was the last lap I led in that Daytona right. 500. But you can say, I mean, <clears throat> I never led lap one at Daytona, so, you know, that that's a... Oh, it was cool. No, it was very cool. Um, and, and the thing is, I was in it all day long. I was in the top five all day long. Uh, if I had a clue what I was doing out there, I would have probably won the race. I mean, I had a car that was very capable of winning the race. I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have enough experience at the time. But by the end of 93, started putting some things together, started finishing up front uh, on a more consistent basis. And, 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 and really, I, something clicked. We took that into 94. And prior to that May race in, in Charlotte, it was a top 10 here and then a top five there. We started building momentum and consistency. And I think we finally felt like, hey, we've, we, we've got a team that's ready to do this. We just got to find the right opportunity. And that opportunity came in one of the biggest races, certainly the longest race, the 600. I was running second to Rusty Wallace in the closing laps. And Ray, um, he, uh, he says, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stay out if this thing goes green. We're going to see what the leader does, which was Rusty Wallace. Rusty comes down, takes four tires and fuel. He calls me in a few laps later, says, okay, two tires, two tires, two tires. Because to do four tires, let's say back then it probably took, you know, 16 seconds. That was a pretty slow right side stop, I must say. Um, but um, let's say it took 16 seconds. So, you know, right side takes eight. And so I came out with an eight-second lead. But I think we still ended with a, like a five-second lead or something at the end. So obviously a pretty amazing call. I, I love the idea of the first brickyard. Um, it, it combines so many things. And you don't have to be even a diehard race fan. I remember how big that ticket was that NASCAR is coming to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And it's kind of like your boyhood dream of racing at oh, this... Yeah this you know this track that's just this myth mythical track and and so now it's interesting because you've got nascar drivers at indy and now you've got indy drivers driving nascar yeah aj Stock was cars. in that race i think alan sir jr maybe was in that i race think danny too. sullivan was in that, that race yes? um that's so cool to me it's the inaugural brickyard 400 yes. right Tell, me, yeah, tell so me about that. I was absolutely elated to be a part of it. Uh, when they announced it, I had no idea what was going to happen. That's for sure. But uh, I can tell you that the buildup in 94, those races that led to that win at the 600, and then the confidence we took out of the 600, yeah. we were just able to continue to build, to go to the Brickyard, and not just be a contender, but actually be one of the favorites. Here it is. Just a little more than five laps left to go. There. Oh, here we go. Ernie Slip going in one. Ernie Slip and Jeff Gordon gets alongside. Urban drops off the pace, and now Brett Bodine goes into second. Ernie Urban heads for the warm-up lane, and Jeff Gordon has the lead. Listen to this crowd in Indiana as they cheer their boy, Jeff Gordon. And Jeff Gordon is about to write his name in the racing history books. Years from today, when 79 stock car races have been run here, we'll remember the name. Jeff Gordon, winner of the inaugural Brickyard 400. <laughs> How about that crowd, my God? <laughs> Still the biggest ever for a NASCAR race. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that whole experience the way the fans embraced it from all over, it, it was, it still to me is, is 
it made the experience, especially the winning experience, because after the race was over, they put you in a convertible car and drive you around the track and you're waving to the crowd. And there's still 100,000 people or more still in the grandstands even when the race was over. So it was uh, it was a spectacular and, and really life-changing experience. The 600 was a big deal, but living out a childhood dream uh, in more than a dream. Like as a kid dreaming, I dreamed of racing at Indianapolis. That dream didn't include winning. And, and it certainly didn't include a historical moment in NASCAR and Indianapolis Motor uh, Speedway history. And I know it didn't include you in a stock car. None of it included me in a stock car. But but I must say, by making, you know, by, by everything that happened, open wheel racing, not getting to go to Indy for, you know, those reasons, and then going to NASCAR and, and taking that risk and that chance and then being accepted by that community and then winning was even sweeter. Um, you mentioned that being, you were accepted in the NASCAR community. Sort of, yeah. Sort of. <laughs> but one guy who, who you would think, as an outsider, at least I would, who wouldn't accept you, but who did, was Dale Earnhardt. When did that acceptance come? Was it immediately? Did you have to prove yourself to him? I, I think it was uh, the second or third race of the year. Again, Atlanta uh, won, won that race against Bobby Labonte and Dale Earnhardt. And immediately I knew, okay, we've got something really special here. Like we won last year. Now we've got something that is even to another level. We're, we're a team that is going to go compete for the championship. And we're going to go have to go through Earnhardt to do it. And immediately he started kind of playing the games that he plays, not just on the track, but within the media. And it immediately built this rivalry among our fans. And so his fans, they were like, okay, he doesn't like Gordon. Gordon's his rival. That's our rival. And then my fan base is growing. So if you're up in the grandstands, it's, you're a Gordon fan. Guess what? I'm an Earnhardt fan. Or I'm an Earnhardt, vice versa. And so, it was it was an interesting dynamic because I didn't understand it at first. I'm winning races. Things couldn't be better professionally, but then I'd go to driver introductions, which is a big deal in NASCAR. And you go across the stage and they announce your name, and people are booing, and 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 that told me right then how many fans Dale Earnhardt had. I mean, he just, he just blanketed the grandstands with, you know, his gear and his hat and his fans. And it, it, at it the beginning, crazy. they, they, they kind of loved you, the new guy. And, but, but once you started beating Dale, yeah, it was like, it was like, woo, whoa, Hey, yeah. what's going on here? Ah, <laughs> oh, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right, and in 95, the two of you win five of the first ten races. Yeah. So that's, as you say, where this, this rivalry, I talked to Ray Evernham, and he said, I said, what, what about this rivalry? He said, rivalry. He said, uh, Dale knew how to play the game, and he made this a bigger deal than it really was because he was trying to sell T-shirts. It's true. What he brought was not just the ability to drive a, a race car that was unbelievable, but he had like a marketing mind that he was constantly figuring out how can we push the envelope, make the sport bigger, grow the sport. How can I, you know, do something on the track that's going to garner more fans for me and for the sport. He didn't just, it wasn't just all about him. He looked at the, the whole sport, but most of it was for him. Right. <laughs> and, and, uh, he excelled at it and he saw an opportunity and me, I was just a kid. I just wanted to win. I didn't care about, you know, selling T-shirts and hats. I cared about winning races, and I wanted to win the championship. And and if you know, if he pushed and shoved me on the racetrack, I just stood clear. Ooh, I don't want any part of that. Uh, but the good news is, I had a race car and a race team that was good enough to go and kind of get the last word. Up to now, John Bickford, your stepdad, has been your manager. But at some point, that changes. We had a we had a falling out. You know, uh, I got married uh, in '94, and in in at the in '95, they were still a part, uh, you know, of, of business in, in in my life and and like they had been. 
so they were feeling kind of on like on the outside, even though they were there in 95, but it was shortly after that they, they, they weren't. We, we went our separate ways, um, you know, for several years while, while I was married. Yeah, and that's, I mean, look, you're not the first guy that had to pick wife or spouse over family. You're, you're looking right now currently at a guy <laughs> who may have had to make that same choice at some point, but, but you, their reach was too deep into your business by that point in your life. Yet, I know you well enough to know that, you know, that was hard for oh, you yeah. to do because, you know, you wouldn't be there without John. You wouldn't yeah. be there without your mom, Carol. You, you wouldn't be in that position to be able to say goodbye. I'm going to do this on my own. I'm torn because I decided, you know, I met somebody and, and at 23, I got married. And, you know, looking back, on, I was like, God, what was I thinking? I'm so young. You know, I mean... You can't get married so young and, and be thrown into all this and, and you know, make uh, the decisions that I would be making later in life, in my opinion. If, if winning the cup championship is the dream, in 1995, you have that opportunity in Atlanta. Let's roll the tape. He is so close to winning the 1995 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship, one of the most coveted prizes in all of auto racing. If he can lead one lap and if one car falls out of the race, the NASCAR Winston Cup Championship will be his for 1995. Dale Earnhardt wins the 1995 season finale at Atlanta Motor Speedway, the Napa 500. But the championship goes to Jeff Gordon. So now you have a championship. It, it, it was one of the greatest years of my life, one of the most difficult because, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like I was... I, I felt like that was that moment, right, when you're, you're crowned the championship, and that was that moment where my mom and my dad, they deserved the trophy more than I did. They're, if it weren't for their sacrifices and all that they had done, it would have never happened. And looking back, talking to my parents now, you know, I think they agreed that they were too involved. They, they were... Um, there were ways that we could have... They could have stepped away, but still have been a part of that that moment and the championships that followed where they could have enjoyed it as much as I did or been a part of it as much as I was. And that that was a very difficult time for, for me not being able to to share that with them. You guys start your season kind of with the Super Bowl. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah, no, it's got to be very odd to you. <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, typically you build toward the the big daddy that you everybody can't wait to see, and yet... You kind of pull the curtain up at Daytona. Yeah. So you haven't won there. By the way, Dale hasn't won there right. either. This great, you know, the intimidator, Dale Earnhardt, had not won at that dominated. point Dominated. He dominated every year, led so many laps, and was so good there. And, and yeah, he hadn't won there at that, at that time either. So you get this opportunity. You've been there. We talked about where you were at 21. You led at Daytona after one lap, and you have that little mini thrill uh, but this this is the biggest, I assume. I, I don't I don't want to put this well, these words I, yeah, in your there's, mouth. There's there's to me there's two championships in the season every year in NASCAR. It's winning the championship, and it's winning the Daytona 500. And the Daytona 500 is as if it's its own championship. In '97, we were determined. I mean, we, it was a mission. Jeff Gordon is back in it. Fighting for six. Here goes the pass. Gordon making a move on the inside of Earnhardt. Oh, Jerry loose. Down the back straightaway. Big trouble. Earnhardt out. Jeff Gordon is coming to second spot. Terry Labonte with him. Whoa, look oh. down on the flat here. Gordon's trying to get by Elliott going into turn one. Gordon out in front. Back on the inside off turn four. And trouble. There's trouble coming down off that banking. One, two, three. Checkers and yellow. So there it is. You, you stayed ahead of the mess back there. I did. You, you know, you don't, 
unfortunately, they were inside my car at the time when I was passing Earnhardt, so you don't see the whole the whole pass. But he started slipping a little bit, and I saw it. And I guess I thought, well, what would Earnhardt do in this situation? <laughs> because I, I basically got right up on his bumper. My car was handling really good, and I had the fresher tires. And I got right up on his bumper, and he just slid up the track just enough for me to, to nose my way in there. We never touched, but we were, I was just right there, and he, he didn't back off. He, pretty stubborn guy. When he got the outside wall, he had to finally lift, and then somebody behind him hit him and, and, and flipped him over. And I remember looking in my mirror going, oh, gosh, that's not good. Like, I, I want to race Dale. I want to beat Dale, but I, I don't want to wreck Dale. Every time we have somebody sit there, we have a quote on the wall, racing is not what I like to do, it's winning. What does that quote mean to you? Yeah, I mean, that's what, when I was a kid in quarter midgets at five years old, and, and the first time I won my first race, and the checkered flag was waving, and, and, and I got that trophy, that's when I got hooked. It, you know, the, driving the car and the speed of it, that's one thing, but being able to accomplish what it's like to to achieve the ultimate goal of winning the race and, and all that goes into it and, and the moves you make and the decisions you make and the role your team plays. I mean, that that to me is what it was always all about. It was an unbelievable year for you. I mean, you end up with your second cup championship. Life was good. I was I was uh, I was happy going to the racetrack. And, right. and I mean, things were exploding because I was experiencing uh, success, money, um, you know, getting opportunities, and, and I guess you call it fame. I've never considered myself famous. I feel, I've always said I've got the perfect kind of fame. I can call into a restaurant and I can get a reservation with a good table, but I don't have people hiding out in my bushes wanting to take pictures of me on my, you know, vacation. It's because you have security. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They can't get close enough. <laughs> Uh, but but at that time things are pretty nuts. Uh, it was it was coming faster than I probably knew what to do with. NASCAR is blowing up at, at this moment. You know, in in your history, I mean, it's becoming, it's growing, it's getting bigger, and you're dominant. Is the governing body of NASCAR worried that you are too dominant to make it interesting? You know what I mean. Yeah, because unlike Earnhardt, where he, he sort of saw the bigger picture, he spent a lot more time with, with say, Bill French Jr., who was running NASCAR, owned NASCAR that time. And, and Bill would explain to him, you know, hey, listen, this is racing, but this is, this is a sport, an entertainment sport. And so what happens on the track, if it's not entertaining, people aren't going to want to watch it. Um, we're not just out there to see who the fastest car is and, and you know, who uh, who can come from 10th to 1st. That part's great, but it's a lot more than that. Me, I didn't get that. I was just, I'm going to pass the car. I want to win the race. I don't care how exciting it is. Um, you know, I don't, you know, it, none, none of that at that time mattered to me. I just wanted to win. And so if I had a six-second lead, I wanted a second-second lead. Uh, and Ray Evernham was giving me cars to give me those things. And so... All of a sudden, we something happened, and and Ray got had had a conversation with someone. They said, "Listen, boy, y'all are stinking up the show, and and that's not good for NASCAR. Uh, you need to to be thinking about that." And and so we had that conversation. So we actually we had uh, a signal in the car. If I had a big lead. They would say, okay, you know, one second lead. All right, two second lead, three second lead. All right, Jeff, you're at four seconds. And it would never get more than four seconds. I, I, You'd I, back I'm, it down? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. To keep it interesting. Just just to make sure that it didn't, you know, get too... Now, granted, that was those were good times. <laughs> it was a great, great problem to have when you had to back off to continue not to have more than a four-second lead. I, I wish I could have bottled those moments up and held on to them later in my career. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how much the sport was, you know, and, and everybody within it was looking at, um, you know, w how is this reflecting to the fans and, and to, the, to the TV audience? We're growing. We're on this incredible path. Let's not screw it up.
1998, you win 13 races, you win your third cup championship. And it's not long thereafter that you and Ray split. Mm -hmm. What led to that? Seems to be a trend. Yeah. I, what's going on? But, but all these people, you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of they leave and then they come back. And yeah. then they, it's so, why, why did you split with Ray? Well, with, with Ray, it, it, it was pretty much a mutual thing. I, of course, I didn't want to, to split up. He was amazing. And I think we would have won more races and championships if we had stayed together. But uh, we had kind of a, uh, 99 was a bit of a tough year. Um, you know, we just come off the most incredible year, 98, as you mentioned, right. 13 wins in the championship. In 99, we were still winning some races, but we were getting beat. And I just started seeing frustration as, like, who's, who, who's the leader of this team? Is it Ray or is it me or is it Rick Hendrick? And, and I think that I was getting all the notoriety, and Ray uh, probably wasn't getting as much as he deserved. Um, and so... He got an opportunity. Dodge was going to come into the sport. And, of course, who would, who would you go to to build your team and come into NASCAR? I'd go after Ray Evernham, and they did. And, um, and, and, you know, it wasn't a difficult decision for him. Now, he and I spoke about me coming with him. We had, you know, a, a couple brief conversations, and, and I just told him, I said, listen, you know, I, I'm happy with where I'm at. I don't want us to split up, but I'm happy for you. That's a great opportunity, but I'm going to stay here. And he ended up doing the Dodge thing. I ended up signing a lifetime contract with Hendrick Motorsports. By, by 2001, there's a new player in the game in Fox Sports. That's, that's how much this, this <coughs> sport itself of NASCAR. Yeah, I mean, you saw that was ESPN2. That, that, you know, that final race in Atlanta when we won the championship yeah. was on. I mean, Things it's, have it's, changed a lot. So it goes to Fox, which is, you know, where you hang your hat now professionally. And, and they get in the game. And the first race is obviously Daytona. Mm -hmm. And that's when the world loses Dale Earnhardt. He, and, and I remember watching it at the time. It wasn't a dynamic wreck. No. But it was enough with whatever the right conditions were to end his life. And, and, and that, I'm sure, was a blow to you personally, obviously to the sport, as you've talked about his, his importance overall. I mean, you know, as much as me and him butted heads and had wrecks and had this rivalry, um, I still looked up to him so much and respected him and, and enjoyed, you know, racing with him and learning from him on and off the track. And I looked at him as this superhuman person that was almost untouchable. I saw him wreck, flip. I mean, the flip at Daytona when I won and walk away every single time. Or one time he had a pretty bad wreck and, and broke his sternum. And the next race went to Watkins Glen. He's not even known to be a road racer. And he sat on the pole. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, he was tough. So... The thought of, and, and now I'll be honest, on the other side, safety, you know, wise, he had a certain way and comfort about the way he wanted to be in the car, the way the seat belts were mounted, the way the seat was shaped, the helmet, you know, he always wore that open face helmet. And I always worried about him from that sense because, you know, the younger kind of new way was this wrap around cocoon seat, headrest, um, you know, seven point, six point harnesses, uh, you know, really covering, you know, taking care of your, your head and how it moves. And Dale was just, he want, I mean, he, I'd see him sometimes, you know, he'd have his arm and his one Come hand. On. I swear, I'm not joking. I'll never forget. In a race. In a race. I'm driving down. I'm like this, right? And I look over and he's like, <laughs> no joke, no joke. Um, that's an absolute true story. I'm not kidding. And that's how comfortable he was in his environment. Later in 2001, you, you have a chance to win your fourth cup championship in Atlanta. Again, Atlanta is uh, kind of where a lot of the magic has happened for you. Yeah. Um, was it hard at all to climb back in the car after this kind of untouchable icon has died because, because of a wreck? It was very odd going to the track with, with, without Dale. You know, just his team, the fans... I mean, the, the feeling, and not, I mean, he was, he impacted so many different lives within the, the garage area. 
I mean, this, the, fa- the NASCAR, you know, France family, I mean, that, it was devastating. It really, I can't describe how impactful it was. But for you personally, did it ratchet up any fear or well, anything the, like the that? The only thing I can tell you is that when you're a race car driver and you've been racing as long as I have, you, you see death, you know, and, and you have to deal with it. You have to um, get back in and, 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 and go to the next race and, and block that out of your mind. So while off the track, I was, I was not sure how, how to handle it and accept it on the track. It's sort of my way of, of, of getting away from it. And, and race, racing does that in a lot of ways. It allows you to escape from, from reality. I mean, I get out there and it's just nothing but racing. I don't have to worry or think about anything else other than that. Here's 2001 in Atlanta. He's wiggling in the car. The fuel pressure's low. Does Labonte have time to catch him? The leader's off the pace. Bobby Labonte wins the race. And Jeff Gordon has locked up the championship. Another NASCAR Winston Cup championship. His fourth. One of only three men to win four or more championships. You, you called that your most satisfying win. Yeah. And, and you're doing that without Ray. Yeah. Nothing personal against Ray. It was just, for me, it was an accomplishment that... It's that validation. Was, yeah, it was a huge, huge um, amount of validation of, of what I've been working for my, my whole career. And, and to be able to go do that and, and then get the credit of, he's a four-time champion, and hey, maybe he's actually, you know an awesome race car driver too because before up to that i felt like you know i got credit but it was really the the culmination and i see it with jimmy johnson today i mean that guy's unbelievable race car driver seven championships and because you're at hendrick and chad canals is your your crew chief it's well, okay is jimmy the best or where does he rank 2007 you tie dale earnhardt for the most victories I, I can't imagine what that meant to, to climb even now. We know what's going to come, but you climb even with, with Dale, your hero, your idol, your competitor, your rival. I mean, that, that's a hell of an accomplishment. It was. I, I never, I thought, you know, as I told you earlier, my goal was to win one race when I first started. So to th- then go win that many races, what, I think it was what, 87, 86, I can't remember how, how many races it was, but, uh, I mean, that to me was just an unbelievable to, to tie a record of one of the all-time legends and greats. And so when I tied him that day in Phoenix, uh, we put a, a three flag in, in the window of my car as I drove around the racetrack. That, I mean, that's the ultimate sign of respect that, you know, what, six years later, you're, you're putting his number up. Everybody cheered. As a matter of fact, Dale Earnhardt Jr. came into Victory Lane to thank me for, for doing that and how cool he thought it was. But then Talladega, you have the chance to pass Dale Earnhardt for most cup wins. Let's take a look. Oh, there goes Stewart, the 20 to the high side with no help. They're three wide off the road. There's only one attempt at this green white check. And Stewart has crashed. Checkered flag waves on Jeff Gordon, his 77th career NASCAR next up cup victory. I never dreamed we were going to win that race. Um, you know, just didn't think we'd get 77 here. And I don't think, I think there's a lot of people out there that uh, didn't want us to. Um, hey, what's with the fans throwing stuff? What's going on? I don't know. I thought I thought Junior had more power than that, though, because I thought they were going to throw a toilet paper. Uh, that's what he asked him to throw. And you know what? There's a lot of lot of fans out there that are big Earnhardt fans and uh, probably didn't want to see this uh, broken. And I appreciate the enthusiasm and, and, and you know, the opinions of, of all the fans out there. So. What are you going to do? You know, we're here to win. <laughs> I mean, they're littering your car with stuff. You don't take that personally, do you? No, I love that. At, at, I mean, I, at first, I didn't understand it, and it bothered me. Then I realized it was actually a great thing. When, when people were booing and throwing things, um, it, 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 it was, again, that, that, that rivalry, that... that made things interesting and exciting it and, shows people and, care yeah i mean what do you their want passion. as an athlete their passion how, how are you gonna not be happy for fans showing their passion and i love i love their loyalty you know to to earnhardt as well why did you decide that 2015 would be your last year yeah so i started having some back issues some lower back 
pain and spasms and, and pain in the car, uh, probably around, uh, I mean, it probably even goes back to 2005 or six, but it really started getting bad around 2010. And, and I, I started working on it, physical therapy and different things. And I went to Rick Hendrick and I said, Rick, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do this. My body is just not doing well. I'm in a lot of pain throughout the race and every time I get out of the car. If that quote means anything to you, racing is not what I like to do, it's winning. I, I would assume that even going into your last year, your goals are to win. Yeah. You're not racing to kill time. You're not racing because Rick wants you to. You're racing to win. I, I prepared myself. I, uh, I, I, was, I was happy about the decision. Um, I was, you know, in talks with Fox about doing the broadcasting, uh, working with Rick and the team. So I had a good plan in place um, and was, was, was ready to go and was hoping that I'd have a great year in 15 and, Turned out to be pretty good. It was a good year. You hadn't won until Martinsville. Let's watch the video. Here goes Jeff Gordon. Gordon leading at Martinsville. And he did not have to make contact. He was able just to easily pass off and Dinger. He didn't want to make contact. He didn't want to cause a potential issue for himself. 16 laps to go. Jeff Gordon in his final season, his final Martinsville start. Out of three and four. This win's gonna punch his ticket to the championship four. Gordon wins in Martinsville. You won it nine times at Martinsville. And when you win, they give you a grandfather clock. A grandfather clock. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of clocks. There's a lot of grandfather clocks floating around. Um, do you give them to friends? Are they in every room of your house? Do... We spread the love. Okay. We spread the love. <laughs> Everybody can tell time. I, I kind of get the feeling like if, if you were 74 and somebody woke you up one morning and said, Jeff, there's a race later today. A, you would like sprint out of bed at <laughs> 74 and B would have half a shot at winning the thing. I mean, you're, you're <laughs> oh, kind of. Martinsville? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're kind of. I do feel that way about Martinsville. I feel like. Uh, I could go five years, ten years, be out of the car, and if somebody said, hey, you got a shot to put you in a good car at Martinsville, I'd go, yeah, I think I could do it. And you did kind of linger a little bit so that your kids would understand what you did. That was the greatest part to me about uh, going through 2015 is, you know, my daughter and my son were both old enough to know what that experience was like, that, that Martinsville experience, as well as, you know, uh, some, some just special moments that we had on maybe a driver intro stage or something. And, and to me, that's what changed the game for me was having kids and my whole purpose to go compete and do well was to make them proud right. and, and let them experience what, it was like that what their dad did and, and, and to, you know, there's nothing that, better than sharing that with the people that you love. One example you set is that you show up and you do your job for your kids, 797 consecutive races. You're, you're the Iron Man uh, for NASCAR. That's unbelievable. As you look back yeah, on thank that. You. <laughs> I would imagine, I would imagine you're as proud of that mark as you are of, of any of the cup championships or anything. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it a whole lot until I got to maybe six or 700. And then I saw, what the heck? How did I run that many races? Where, where did I go from being the kid to, to the old guy? Right. <laughs> um, it goes fast, right? Yeah, it flew by. Um, but I'm, a, I'm very proud of that. You know, it's, what's interesting, not a lot of people think of me as the tough guy out there. They don't think of me as the Iron Man, you know, but I'm a lot stronger than people think. And, and, and a lot of it's mentally, um, but I, I, I've put myself through times where I probably shouldn't have been out there in the race car. And it's just because I believe so much in my team had done so much for me that there's, and, and I, this is a bit of a theme. I know you said you read, you know, read my book and different things that I like, I'm a pleaser, you know, I, I don't like to let people down. And, and when somebody is counting on me, that, that drives me. I, we always end this show with what's next. 
There's nothing that compares to driving that car, having those four tires and that, you know, 800 whatever horsepower engine underneath you, and you're controlling it to the, to, to the finish line to win the race and celebrating with the people that made it happen. So I know that I'll never have that kind of replacement, but I will say from the broadcasting side of it, I, I, I'm just, I'm competitive. So I, I'm competitive with myself. I'm always pushing myself, do better, study more. I, I, I'm still like, wait till like you say rookie. something bad about, I don't know, fill in the blank, X driver. Well, the one thing I get is how, you know, I'm biased towards Hendrick Motorsports. And I'm like, yes, I am. I, right. I, I drove there for 23 years. Own it. They're an awesome team. And, and it's hard to say bad things about them because they usually are doing good. But I, I, I try not to be biased. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh oh. Yeah, go ahead. Start the applause. <clears throat> we end this with a few fun questions. Would you rather never be able to eat hot food again or never take another hot shower? Oh. Yeah, I, I, I like hot food better than I like hot showers. Oh. Really? <laughs> you could stand in the cold shower and put up with that? Sure. Would you rather only be able to whisper or only be able to shout? I would rather be able to whisper because I don't know anything but shouting. And so I, I kind of wish I had more of the calm. I'd like to have your voice, Joe. If I, if I could just, I don't even need, not even a whisper, just like that, that awesome TV radio commentator, yeah. awesome voice. Hey, everybody, welcome. There it is. This is Jeff Gordon. <laughs> Fox would have paid me more money if I had that yeah. voice. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> we can work on that. Last question that I'll ever ask you. What makes a great driver? Ooh. ooh, ooh. Oh, my goodness. Um, I think what makes a great driver is somebody that recognizes, you know, and, and does a great job decision-making risk versus reward. Uh, I think all NASCAR drivers have a pretty good sense of, of how to you know, put the car on the edge, uh, but it's, it's knowing how far to put it out there on the edge and knowing when not to put it on, on the edge that I think gets them to the finish to be there when it counts, but also knows how to get it done in those final laps when it really does count. This has been uh, an absolute joy uh, for me, I, when you look at this guy, you realize he was uh, born to do what you ended up doing. Grew up uh, in California, had to switch states to be able to drive at such a young age, became a champion, became the new face of NASCAR, changed the sport, four-time cup champion, uh, a Hall of Famer in every possible way. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Gordon. Thank you.